Good evening. I'm Russ Germain, and this is Ideas. Starting tonight and throughout this final week of the year, we present the 1977 Massey Lectures. The lectures are called Myth and Meaning, and they're given by the distinguished anthropologist Claude Lévi-Strauss. You see, I'm not trying to formulate a philosophy, nor even a, a theory. Since I was a child, I've been bothered by, let's call it, the irrational, and uh, trying to find an order behind what is given to us as a disorder. And uh, it so happened that I became an anthropologist, and as a matter of fact, not at all, because I was interested in anthropology. I was trying to get out of philosophy. And it so happened that uh, in the Along French with the Massey Lectures, we also begin a series called Red Man, White World. It's a look at the confrontation between the Indian and white cultures in North America. It'll be heard each evening this week following the Massey Lecture and will continue on into the new year. But first, to this year's Massey Lecturer. Claude Lévi-Strauss is 69 years old. Professor of Social Anthropology at the Collège de France in Paris, he's perhaps the world's greatest living anthropologist and the leading exponent of what is known as structuralism. Structuralism he describes as a search for invariance, a search for what is constant and unchanging in culture and nature, despite superficial differences. He's tried to learn what it means fundamentally to be human, and his great ambition has been to crack the code of the human mind. Much of his work has been to learn about the structure of the mind from the structure of myth, which he says defines a society and describes its behavior. But myth was lost to us during the Renaissance with the rise of science and the scientific method, and only now, in the latter part of the 20th century, is its importance for human understanding being rediscovered. The title of these lectures is Myth and Meaning. They were recorded as a series of lengthy interviews between Professor Levi Strauss and Carol Orr, producer in the CBC's Paris Bureau, and then edited down for broadcast. The first one is called The Meeting of Myth and Science. Professor Claude Levi Strauss. Now, let me start with a personal confession. There is a magazine which uh, I faithfully read each month from the first line to the last line, although I don't understand all of it, and this is Scientific American. That is, I am extremely eager to get informed as much as I can of everything which takes place in uh, modern science and of the new development. So uh, my uh, position in relation to science is not at all, you see, a negative one. In the second place, I think there are a lot of things we have lost and that we should try. I'm not sure to regain them because I'm not sure that in the kind of world we are living and with the kind of scientific thinking we are bound to follow, we can regain these things exactly as if they had been never lost. But we can become aware of their existence and of their importance. Now, in the third place, my feeling is that the movement of modern science is not at all a way from these uh, lost things, but that more and more it is an attempt to reintegrate them in the field of scientific explanation. You see, the real gap, the real separation between science and uh, well, let's call it a mythical force for the sake of finding a convenient word, although it is not exactly that. The real moment of separation was in the 17th, 18th century. Because at that time, with, let's say, Bacon, Descartes, and uh, Newton and the others, it was necessary for science to 
built itself against the old inheritance of mythical and mystical thought. And this was the time when it was thought that science could only exist by turning its back upon the world of the senses. That is, the world of the senses, the world we see, we smell, we taste, you perceive. This was a delusive world. And uh, the real world was a world of mathematical properties which could only be grasped by the intellect and which was entirely at odd with uh, the false testimony of the senses. And this was probably a necessary move. And experience shows us that uh, thanks to this separation, thanks to this uh, schism, if, if you like, that was the condition for scientific thought to get constituted. Now, uh, my uh, impression, and of course uh, I don't talk as a scientist because I'm not a physicist, I'm not a biologist, I'm not a chemist, but nevertheless my feeling is that contemporary science tends to overcome this gap. And more and more, the sense data are being reintegrated into scientific explanation as something which has a meaning, which has a truth, and which can be explained. If you take, for instance, the world of smells, we are accustomed to think that this was entirely subjective outside the world of science. Now, the chemists are able to tell us that each smell or each taste has a certain chemical uh, composition and to give us the reasons why subjectively some smells or some tastes feel to us as having something in common and some other as being widely different. Uh, let's take another example. See, there was, and still is to some extent, in philosophy since the time of the Greek up to the 18th and even the 19th century, a tremendous discussion about the origin of uh, mathematical ideas. Say, the idea of the line, the idea of the circle, the idea of the triangle, and there are two uh, classical theories, one of the mind as a tabula rasa, that is, there is nothing in it in the beginning, and everything comes from experience. It is from seeing a lot of round objects, which are not, none of them perfectly round, but nevertheless, that we uh, get able to abstract the idea of a circle, and another one, which goes back to Plato, that such ideas that the circle or the triangle or the line are perfect, innate in the mind, and it is because they are properties of the mind that uh, we are able to project them, so to speak, on reality, although reality never offers us uh, a perfect circle or a perfect triangle. Now, contemporary researchers on the neurophysiology of vision teach us that the nervous cells in the retina are specialized and that some cells are only sensitive to straight direction in the vertical sense, some other in the horizontal, some other in the oblique, uh, some of them to the relationship between the background and the central figures and the like. So, and uh, I simplify very much because uh, it's too complicated to explain in a different language, but the old problem of experience versus mind seems to have a solution in the structure of the nervous system, not in the structure of the mind. 
not in the experience, but in between mind and experience, that is, the way our nervous system is built and the way it mediates between mind and experience. Now, uh, probably there is something lying very deep in my own mind, and uh, it seems likely that I always was uh, what is being called now a structuralist. You see, my mother told me that uh, when I was about uh, two years old, and uh, still unable to read, of course, I claimed that actually I was able to read. And when I was asked why, I said that when I uh, looked at the signboards on shops saying, for instance, boulanger, baker, or uh, boucher, butcher, then I was able to read something because obviously what was similar from a graphic point of view in the writing could not mean other thing than bou, because the first syllable is the same in boucher and uh, boulanger. And probably in uh, the structuralist approach, there is nothing more than that. That is a quest for the invariant, the invariant elements, despite superficial uh, differences. And uh, throughout my life, this was probably a predominant uh, interest. See, when I was uh, a child, a bit older than uh, the period I was referring to a moment mm -hmm. ago, my main interest was geology. And the problem in geology is also to try to understand what is invariant in the tremendous diversity of landscapes, that is, to be able to reduce a landscape to a finite number of uh, geological layers and of uh, geological operation. And uh, also I spent uh, a great part of my leisure time as a child, as an adolescent boy, drawing uh, costumes and sets for opera. And the problem there is exactly the same. That is to try to express in one language, that is the language of uh, graphic arts and painting, something which also exists in music and which also exists in the libretto that is to reach invariant property of a very complex, not say code, but set of codes. Because there is the musical code, there is the literary code, and there is the artistic code, and the problem is to find what is common to all of them. It's a problem, let's say, of translation to translate what is expressed in one language, or one code if you prefer, but language is uh, sufficient, to be able to express it in a different language. And you see, the structuralism, or what usually goes under that name, has been considered as something completely new. And this, I think, is doubly false. In the first place, because even in the field of the humanities, it is not new at all. And we can follow very well uh, this trend of thought uh, from the Renaissance to the 19th century and to the present time. But it is also wrong for another reason. What we call structuralism in the field of linguistics or anthropology or the like is nothing else than a very uh, pale and uh, faint imitation of what the hard science, I think you say in English, has have been doing all the time. You see, science has only uh, two ways of uh, proceeding. It is either reductionism or structuralism. 
reductionism when it is possible to uh, find out that a very complex phenomenon on one level uh, can be reduced to simpler phenomena on other level. For instance, there is a lot of things in life which can be reduced to physiochemical processes which explain a part but not all. And uh, when we are confronted with uh, phenomena too complex to be reduced to phenomena of a lower order, then you can only approach them by looking to their relationships. Uh, that is, to try to understand what kind of system, original system, uh, they make up. And this is exactly what we have been trying to do uh, in linguistics, in anthropology, in different fields. It is true that in nature, let's personalize nature for the sake of the argument, that nature has only a limited number of procedures at its disposal. And the kind of procedure which nature uses at one level of reality are bound to reappear at different levels. And uh, the genetic code is a very good example because, uh, well, it is well known that when the biologists and the geneticists had the problem of describing what they had discovered, they could do nothing better than to borrow the language of linguistics and to speak of words, of phrase, of accent, of punctuation marks, and the like. I do not mean at all that it is the same thing. Of course, it is not. Mm -hmm. But it is the same kind of problem arising at two different levels of reality. And it would be very far from my mind to try to reduce culture, as we say in our uh, anthropological jargon, to nature. But nevertheless, what we witness at the level of culture are phenomena of the same kind from a formal point of view. I do not mean at all substantially, but which raise at least the same problem to the mind that we can uh, observe on the level of nature. Of course, much more complex, much more complicated, and uh, calling upon a much larger number of variables. You see, I'm not trying to formulate a philosophy nor even a, a theory. Since I was a child, I've been bothered by, let's call it, the irrational, and uh, trying to find an order behind what is given to us as a disorder. And uh, it so happened that I became an anthropologist, and as a matter of fact, not at all, because I was interested in anthropology. I was trying to get out of philosophy. And it so happened that uh, in the French academic framework, uh, since uh, anthropology was at the time not taught uh, as a discipline uh, in its own mm -hmm. right in French universities, so it was possible for somebody uh, trained in philosophy and uh, teaching philosophy to escape to anthropology, so I escaped there. And there I was confronted with immediately one problem, that is that there was a lot of rules of marriage all over the world, which looked absolutely meaningless, and it was all the more irritating, because if they were meaningless, then there should be different rules, a rule for each people, let's say so, and nevertheless, the number of rules were more or less finite. So. If the same absurdity was bound to reappear over and over again, and another kind of absurdity also to reappear, then there was something which was not absolutely absurd, or else it would not reappear. That was my first orientation, to try to find an order behind this apparent disorder. And when, after working on uh, kinship system and uh, marriage rules, 
also by chance and not at all on purpose. I uh, turned my attention toward mythology. The problem was exactly the same, that mythical stories are or seem arbitrary, seem meaningless, seem absurd, and nevertheless seem to reappear all over the world and uh, a fanciful creation of the mind in one place was not unique, but uh, you would find the same one in a completely different place in the world. And my problem was trying to find out if there was some kind of order behind this apparent disorder. So uh, that's all. And uh, I do not claim at all that there are conclusions to be drawn. Now, you raise the question of meaning without order. This, I think, is absolutely impossible to conceive because, see, there is something very curious in semantic that the word meaning is probably the word, the meaning of which it is most difficult to find. What means to mean? It seems to me that the only answer we can give is that to mean means the ability of any kind of data to be translated in a different language. I do not mean a different language as uh, French, German, or, or the like, but uh, to be expressed in different words on a different level. And after all, that's what a dictionary does. You open a dictionary, and the dictionary is expected to give you the meaning of the world. What is to give you the meaning of the word is to replace the word by different words which, on a slightly different level, are isomorphic to the word or the expression you are trying to understand. Now, what would be a translation without rule? It would be absolutely impossible to understand because you could replace any word by any other word, any sentence by any other sentence. So you have to have rule of translation. And to speak of rule and to speak of meaning is to speak of the same thing. And if we look at all the intellectual undertaking of mankind, as far as they have been recorded and uh, all over the world, the common denominator is always to introduce some kind of order. And if this is a basic need of the human mind, and since, after all, the human mind is only a part of the universe, well, it's probably because there is some order in the universe, and the universe is not a chaos. Claude Lévi-Strauss, professor of social anthropology at the Collège de France, with the first of the 1977 Massey Lectures. His subject tomorrow will be Primitive Thinking and the Civilized Mind. This year's Massey Lectures are being published by the University of Toronto Press, and they'll be available in paperback in the early spring of 1978. You'll be able to get them at your bookstore, or you can obtain a copy by sending $5 to the University of Toronto Press, Front Campus, Toronto, Ontario, M5S1A6. In a moment, Red Man, White World. Good evening. I'm Russ Germain, and this is Ideas. This week, we're presenting the 1977 Massey Lectures by the distinguished anthropologist Claude Lévi-Strauss. Then, in about 20 minutes from now, Red Man, White World, part two of our look at the confrontation between Indian and white cultures in North America. Tonight's show is called The Hollywood Indian. But we begin with the second of this year's Massey Lectures. The theme is Myth and Meaning. Last night, in the first of his five talks, Claude Lévi-Strauss discussed the meeting of myth and science. Mythology, he said, had been lost to us during the Renaissance with the rise of science and the scientific method. Science sought to explore the universe in a formal, intellectual way, looking for objective truths. Mythology, by contrast, relied upon what he called the data of the senses, 
which science considered unobjective and unreliable. The two went their separate ways. At present, however, we are seeing a reintegration of these two ways of knowing, and the value of what was lost with the decline of myth is being rediscovered. This year's Massey Lectures were recorded last summer in Paris as a series of lengthy interviews between Professor Levi Strauss and Carol Orr, producer in the CBC's Paris Bureau. They were then edited down for broadcast. Tonight, Professor Levi Strauss elaborates on the theme he began yesterday. His talk is called Primitive Thinking and the Civilized Mind. Claude Levi Strauss. Now, what you call my hypothesis is that the way of thinking of the people we call usually and wrongly primitive, but let's say uh, without writing, because I think this is really the discriminatory factor between them and us, their way of thinking was uh, interpreted in uh, two different fashions, which, uh, in my opinion, were equally wrong. Uh, the first one was to consider it as inferior. And in contemporary anthropology, the example which comes to mind immediately is the work of uh, Malinowski, for whom I must immediately say I have the greatest respect and whom I consider as a very great anthropologist. It's not at all uh, a way of deriding his contribution. But nevertheless, the feeling of Malinowski was uh, that the thought of the people he was uh, studying was, and generally speaking, of all the populations without writing, which are the subject matter of uh, anthropology, was entirely uh, is uh, determined by the basic needs of life. It is that if you know that a people, uh, whatever it is, is determined by the bare necessities of living, that is to find uh, subsistence, to satisfy the sexual drives, and uh, so on, then you can explain their social institution, their beliefs, mythology, and uh, the like. So it is what goes generally under the name of functionalism, and uh, it is a very widespread conception uh, in anthropology. The other one is uh, not so much that it is an inferior kind of thought, but a fundamentally different one. And this is ex exemplified by the work of uh, Livy Brühl who consider that the basic difference between primitive thought, I always put the word primitive within quotes, you see, and uh, modern thought, is that the first one is uh, entirely determined by emotion and mystic representations. So in one case, it is a utilitarian conception, uh, Malinowski's, and in the other, an uh, emotional or affective conception. And uh, what I've tried to emphasize is that actually the thought of people without writing is or can be, in many instances, on the one hand, disinterested, and this is a difference in relationship to Malinowski, and, on the other hand, intellectual. And this is a difference in uh, relation to, to Levi Brühl. What uh, I've tried to show in Totemism and in the Savage Mind is that these people are perfectly capable of disinterested thinking that is moved by a need or a desire to understand the world around them, nature and society, and on the other hand, that to achieve that end, they proceed by intellectual means, exactly as a philosopher, or even to some extent 
a scientist can do. This is the basic hypothesis. To say that it is a disinterested way of thinking and that it is an intellectual way of thinking does not mean at all that it is equal to scientific thinking. Of course, it remains different because the aim is to reach by the shortest possible means, if I may say so, to reach a general understanding of the universe. And not only a general, but a total understanding. Uh, that is, it is a way of thinking which goes by implying that if you don't explain everything, you don't explain anything, which is entirely in contradiction with what scientific thinking is doing, which consists in proceeding step by step and trying to give explanation for very limited phenomena and then going to another kind of phenomena and so on. Well, Descartes already said that uh, scientific thinking was to divide the difficulty into as many parts as it is necessary in order to solve it. So this totalitarian ambition of uh, the savage mind is quite different from the procedures of scientific thinking. And, of course, the great difference is that it does not work. We are able, through scientific thinking, to achieve mastery of uh, nature and, uh, well, I don't need to elaborate that point, it's obvious enough, while, uh, of course, a myth is unsuccessful for uh, giving man more material power over the environment. It gives man, and it is very important, it gives man the illusion that he can understand the universe and that he does understand the universe. But it is, of course, an illusion. Now, you were uh, talking about the North American myth from Western Canada about the stingray uh, succeeding to master or to dominate the south wind. It is a story about a time when mankind, or rather uh, what existed on Earth before mankind, that is at a time where animals and humans were not really distinct, that is, a beings which were half human, half animals, were extremely uh, bothered with the winds, because the winds and the bad winds were blowing all the time and making impossible for uh, them to fish and to gather uh, shellfish on the beaches and the lakes, so decided that they had to fight the winds and uh, compel them to behave more uh, decently. And um, there was an expedition in which several animals took part, human animals or animal humans, including the ray, which played a very important role in capturing the south wind, which was only liberated after he promised uh, not to blow all the time, but only from time to time or at certain period and the like. And since that time, it is only at certain period of the year or one day out of two uh, that uh, the south wind blows and the rest of the time uh, mankind can uh, fulfill its activities. Of course, this never happened. But uh, what we have to do is uh, not to satisfy ourselves with the idea that it is plainly absurd and it is just a fanciful creation of uh, the mind, uh, like a kind of delirium. We have to take it up seriously and to ask ourselves the question, why the ray and why the south wind? And uh, when you look very closely at the mythical material, exactly as uh, it is told, you notice that the ray acts on account of very precise characteristics, which are of two kinds. The first one is that it is a fish, like all uh, flat fish, which is uh, slippery underneath and rough on the dorsal part. And the 
other capacities which uh, allows the ray to escape very successfully when it has to fight against other animals is that it's very wide seen from the front and extremely thin when seen in profile. So the adversary think that it will be very easy to shot an arrow and to kill Ray because it's so wide, but at the time when the arrow is shot, suddenly the Ray turns around and shows only its profile, which of course it is impossible to aim at, and uh, it escapes. So, see, the reason why the Ray is chosen is that it is an animal which considered either from one point of view or from the other, is capable of giving, let's say, in terms of modern uh, cybernetics, only a yes or no answer. It is capable of two states which are discontinuous, and one is positive and one is negative. And the use it is put in in the myth is... Uh, so to speak, and of course I would not like to strain the matter uh, too much, but so to speak, like the elements you have in modern computers, which can be used to solve very difficult problems by adding a series of yes or no answer. So, while it is obviously wrong from an empirical point of view, that a fish is able to fight a wind, from a logical point of view, you can understand why images borrowed from experience can be put to use, and this is the originality of mythical thinking, to play the part of conceptual thinking. And that an animal which can be used as what I have called a binary operator, can have, from a logical point of view, a relationship with a problem which is also a binary problem. That is, if the south wind blows every day of the year, then life is impossible for mankind. But if it blows only one day out of two, yes, one day, no, the other day, and so on, then a kind of compromise becomes possible between the needs of mankind and the condition prevailing in the natural world. And so you see that from a logical point of view, there is an affinity between an animal like the ray and the kind of problem which the myth is trying to solve. It's not true from a scientific point of view, but we could only understand this property of the myth at a time when cybernetic and computers have come to existence in the scientific world and have provided us with an understanding of binary operations which were already put to use in a very different way with concrete objects or beings by mythical thought. So there is really not a kind of divorce between mythology and science. It is only the present state of scientific thought which gives us the ability to understand what is in the myth to which we were completely blind before a time when the idea of binary operation have become completely familiar to us. What is important is that we are becoming more and more interested in this qualitative aspect, and that uh, science, which had a purely quantitative outlook in the 17, 18, and even 19th century, is beginning to integrate the qualitative aspects of reality as well. And this, undoubtedly, will enable us to understand a great many things 
which were already present in mythological thinking and which we were prone to dismiss as meaningless and uh, absurd. And the trend will lead us to believe that between life and thought, there is not uh, this absolute gap which was uh, accepted as a matter of fact by the 17th century uh, philosophical dualism. If we are led to believe that what takes place in our mind is something not substantially or fundamentally different of uh, the basic phenomena of life itself. And if we are led then to the feeling that there is not this kind of gap which is impossible to overcome between uh, mankind on the one hand and all the other living beings not only animals, but also plants, on the other, then perhaps we will reach more wisdom, let us say, than what we are uh, capable of. Claude Lévy-Strauss, professor of social anthropology at the Collège de France, with the second of the 1977 Massey Lectures. His third lecture, tomorrow night, is called Hair Lips and Twins, the Splitting of a Myth. This year's Massey Lectures are being published by the University of Toronto Press, and they'll be available in paperback in the early spring of 1978. You'll be able to get a copy at your bookstore, or by sending $5 to the University of Toronto Press, Front Campus, Toronto, Ontario, M5S 1A6. That address again, the University of Toronto Press, Front Campus, Toronto, Ontario, M5S 1A6. In a moment, Red Man, White World. This is Ideas. Good evening, I'm Russ Germain. Tonight, the third of the 1977 Massey Lectures by the distinguished anthropologist Claude Levi Strauss, entitled Hair Lips and Twins The Splitting of a Myth. In part two of our program, Red Man, White World, a documentary on the Métis called The People in Between. Hair lips and twins have been an almost universal feature of human mythology. In many cultures, they've been endowed with special powers, sometimes for good, sometimes for evil. Now, in the third of the 1977 Massey Lectures on Myth and Meaning, Claude Lévi-Strauss discusses their place in mythology. Our starting point will be a puzzling observation recorded by a Spanish missionary in Peru, Father de Arriaga, at the end of the 16th century and which he published uh, early in the 17th century. He says that in a certain part of Peru of his time, in case of bitter cold, the priest did uh, call in all the inhabitants which were known to have been born feet first or who had a hair lip, and also the twins. And they were uh, accused to be responsible for the cold because, as was said, they had eaten salt and uh, peppers and they were ordered to repent themselves and to confess their sins. Now, the fact that uh, twins are correlated with uh, atmospheric disorder is something very uh, common throughout uh, the world, and uh, especially in Canada, since we are talking to Canadian listeners. It is well known that on the coast of British Columbia, among the Indians, the twins were uh, endowed with uh, special powers to bring good weather 
and to dispel storms and the like, but this is not the part of the problem which I wish to consider right here. What strikes me is that older mythographers, uh, for instance, uh, Sir James Fraser, who quotes Ariaga at several instances, never put himself the question why people with hair lips and twins are considered to be uh, similar in some respect. It seems to me that the crux of the problem is to find out why hair lip, why twins, and why hair lips and twins are put together. Now, in order to solve the problem, we have, as uh, sometimes happen, to make a jump from South America to North America, because it will be a North American myth which will give us the clue to the South American one. And, of course, uh, many people have reproached me this kind of uh, procedure by uh, claiming that myth of a given population can only be understood in the framework of the culture of that given population. Now, uh, there are several things which uh, I uh, can answer. In the first place, it seems to me pretty obvious that, uh, as was ascertained, recently or during the last years by the so-called uh, Berkeley School, the population of the America was much larger than it was supposed to be. And uh, since it was much larger, it is obvious that uh, these large populations were to some extent in contact with one another, and that uh, beliefs, practices, and customs were, if I may say so, seeping through, and that a neighboring population was always to some extent aware of what was going on in the other population. This is the first point. The second point, in the case that we are considering right now, is that uh, these myths do not exist isolated in uh, Peru on the one hand and uh, in Canada on the other, but that in between we find them over and over again. So really they are Pan-American myths rather than uh, scattered myths in different parts of the continent. Now, uh, the ancient uh, Tupinambas, that is the coastal Indians of Brazil at the time of the discovery, and those of uh, Peru, had a myth concerning a girl, a woman, which a very poor individual succeed to seduce in a devious way. The best-known version, which was uh, recorded by the French monk André Tevet in the 16th century, explained that the seduced woman gave birth to twins, and uh, the twins were born from one of them, the legitimate spouse and the other uh, twin from the seducer, which is the trickster. The woman has a legitimate husband. She is going to meet the god who will be her husband. And while she is on the way, the trickster intervenes and makes her believe that he is the god and succeeds to seduce her. So she conceives from the trickster, and when she finds the legitimate husband to be, 
she conceived from him and she gives birth to twins. And since this uh, false twins had different fathers, then they have antithetical features. One is brave, the other a coward. One is the protector of the Indians, the other one of the white people. One gives goods to the Indians and the other one, on the contrary, is responsible for, uh, well, a lot of unfortunate happenings. Now, it so happens that uh, in North America, uh, we find exactly the same myth, uh, especially in the northwest of the United States and Canada. In uh, comparison with the South American versions, those uh, coming from the Canadian area show two important differences. For instance, among the Kootenai, who lived in the Rocky Mountains, there is only one fecundation, which has as a consequence the birth of twins, which later on becomes one the sun and the other the moon. And uh, among uh, some other uh, Indians of British Columbia, uh, these uh, of the Salish uh, linguistic stock, I mean the Thompson Indians and the Okanagan, there are two sisters which are uh, tricked by two distinct individuals and uh, they give birth, each one, to a son which are not really twins because they are born from different fathers and from different mothers, but since they were born in exactly the same kind of circumstances, at least from a moral and a psychological point of view, they are similar to some extent to uh, twins. Uh, those versions are, from the point of view of what I'm trying to show, the more important. They weaken the twin character of the hero I've uh, just said, because they are not brothers, they are cousins, and it is only uh, the circumstance of their birth which are closely uh, parallel, that is, they are both born thanks to a trick. Nevertheless, the basic intention remains the same, because nowhere the two heroes are really twins. They are born from distinct fathers, even in the South American version, and they have opposed characters, features, which will be shown in their conduct and in the behavior of their uh, descendant. So we may say that uh, in all cases, uh, children which are said to be twins or believed to be twins are not really so. Or if they are really twins, as in the Kootenai version, they have different adventures later on, which will, if I may say so, untwin them. And this uh, division between uh, two individuals, which are at the beginning presented as twins, either real twins or equivalent to twins, is uh, a basic characteristic of all the myths in uh, South America or uh, North America. Now, uh, uh, in the Salish versions of the myth, uh, there is a very curious detail, and uh, we are going to find out that it is uh, very important. Uh, you remember that uh, in this version, uh, we have no uh, twins whatsoever because there are two sisters which are traveling in order to find uh, each one a husband. 
they were told by their grandmother that uh, they would recognize uh, their uh, husband at such and such characteristics, and they are uh, deluded uh, by the trickster which they meet on their way into believing that he is the husband uh, which they are supposed to uh, marry. And uh, they spend the night with him, and uh, they sleep, uh, both of them, with him, and uh, each uh, of the women will later on give birth to a son. Now, uh, after uh, this uh, unfortunate night spent in the hut of the trickster, the elder sister leaves uh, her younger uh, sister and uh, go uh, visiting her grandmother, which is a mountain goat, and uh, uh, who is also a kind of a magician, and she knows in advance that uh, her granddaughter is coming, and she sends the hare to welcome her on the road. And hare hides under a log, which has fallen in the midst of the road. And uh, when the girl lift her uh, leg in order to cross the log, her can have a look at uh, her genital parts and make a very inappropriate joke about uh, that. Uh, so uh, the girl is furious and uh, strike him with uh, her cane and split his nose. And this is the reason why animals of the Leporidae uh, family have a split nose, which we call a hair lip, precisely on account of this uh, anatomical peculiarity. Uh, in other words, she starts, she initiates on the face and we may say the body of the animal is split, and if the split was carried out to the end, that is not stopping at the nose, but continuing through the body and to the tail, she would transform an individual in twins. These two individuals which are exactly uh, similar, identical, because they are both a uh, part of uh, a whole. And in this respect, it is very important to find out what conception the American Indians all over America entertain about the origin of twins. And uh, it is a fact that uh, the general belief is that the twins result from an internal splitting of the body fluids, which will later on uh, solidify and uh, become the child. For instance, among some North American Indians, the pregnant woman is uh, forbidden to uh, turn around too fast when she is lying down asleep, because if she would, the body fluids would divide into parts, and she would give birth to twins. But to come to our conclusion, the fact that the hair lip is conceived as an incipient twinhood can help us to solve a problem which is quite uh, fundamental for uh, anthropologists working uh, especially in uh, Canada. Uh, that is why uh, the Ojibwa Indians and other groups of the Algonquin-speaking uh, uh, family have selected uh, the hare as uh, the highest deity in which they believed, and several explanations were brought forward. It was said that uh, it is because the hair 
is uh, extremely prolific and is a symbol of fecundity. It was said uh, because uh, the hair was a food which was in much use and uh, quite necessary to the Indians. It was also said because the hair runs very fast and was uh, taken as an uh, example of the talent which the Indians should have and so on. Nothing of that is very convincing. But uh, if my uh, previous interpretation uh, were right, it seems much more convincing to say that first, among the uh, rodent family, the hair is uh, the larger one, the more conspicuous, uh, the more important, so it can be uh, taken as a representative of the uh, rodent uh, family, and that all the rodent exhibit an anatomical peculiarity which make out of them incipient twins. See? Because they are partly split up. And uh, when there are uh, twins or even more children in the bottom of the mother, there is uh, usually in the myth a very serious consequence because even if they are only two, the children start to fight and compete in order to find out who will uh, have the honor of being born first. And uh, one of them, the bad one, does not hesitate to find a shortcut, if I may say so, in order to uh, be born earlier. That is, instead of following the natural road to split up the body of the mother to escape uh, from it. And uh, this, I think, is an explanation of why the fact of being born feet first is assimilated to twinhood, because it is in the case of twinhood that the hurry of one of the twins to be the first one will make him, well, destroy the mother in order, uh, precisely, uh, to be the first one. In both cases, twinhood on the one hand and a delivery feet first are uh, forerunners of a dangerous delivery or I could even call it a heroical delivery. That is where uh, the child will take the initiative and become a, a kind of uh, hero, a murderous hero in some cases, but uh, accomplish a, a very important uh, feat, which explains why in uh, several tribes twins were killed as well as the children born feet first. Now you see the point, the really important one, is uh, that uh, in all uh, American mythology, and uh, I could say in mythology uh, the world over, uh, we have uh, deities or uh, supernaturals which play the roles of uh, intermediary between the powers above and uh, humanity below. And they can be represented in different ways. You have, for instance, uh, characters of the type of a messiah. You have uh, heavenly twins. And uh, we see that the, the place of the hair in uh, Algonquian mythology is uh, exactly in between the... Messia, if I may say so, that is a unique uh, intermediary, and the heavenly twins. He is not twins, but he is incipient twins. He is still a complete individual, a whole uh, individual, but he has a hair lip, that is, he is halfway to becoming a twin. And this explains why in uh, this uh, mythology, hair, as a god, 
has ambiguous characters which have uh, worried uh, commentators and uh, anthropologists uh, quite a lot because sometimes he is a very wise deity which is in charge of putting the universe in order and sometimes a ridiculous clown which goes from mishap to uh, mishap and this also is best understood if we explain the choice of the hair by the algonquian indian as an individual which is uh, between the two condition of a single deity beneficent to mankind and twins one of which is good and the other one is bad but being not yet entirely divided in two being not yet a pair of twin then the two opposite characteristic can remain merged in one and the same person Claude Levi Strauss professor of social anthropology at the Collège de France with the third of the 1977 Massey lectures tomorrow he looks at the relationship between myth and history this year's Massey lectures are being published by the University of Toronto Press they'll be available in paperback in the early spring of 1978 at your local bookstore or you can obtain a copy by sending five dollars to the University of Toronto Press Front Campus, Toronto, Ontario, M5S1A6. That address again, the University of Toronto Press, Front Campus, Toronto, Ontario, M5S1A6. This is Ideas. Good evening, I'm Russ Germain. This week we're presenting the 1977 Massey Lectures by the distinguished anthropologist Claude Lévi-Strauss. So far he's talked about the meeting of myth and science, how modern science is including data from mythology, what Professor Lévi-Strauss calls the data of the senses in its approach to knowledge, primitive thinking and the civilized mind, in quotes, a look at some similarities and differences between so-called primitive thought and modern thought, and hare lips and twins, their place and importance in world mythology. This year's Massey Lectures were recorded last summer in Paris as a series of lengthy interviews between Professor Levi-Strauss and Carol Orr, producer in the CBC's Paris Bureau. They were then edited down for broadcast. His fourth talk tonight is called When Myth Becomes History. In our society, he says, history has replaced mythology, but it fulfills a similar function, to explain the past, provide a guide to the present, and prepare us for the future. But there's one important difference between them. The aim of mythology, he says, was to ensure that the future would be as faithful as possible to both the present and the past, while the aim of history is to make the future different. He begins with a discussion of how mythology comes down to us and some of the problems we have interpreting it. Professor Claude Levi-Strauss. There are uh, two problems, I think. One is a theoretical problem of great importance for the mythologist because when we look at the published material both in North and South America and uh, elsewhere in the world it so appears that the material is of uh, two different kind. Sometimes anthropologists have collected the myth which look more or less as shreds and patches, if, if I may say so, disconnected stories which are put one after the other, but uh, without any clear relationship between them. And uh, in some other instances, uh, for instance, in South America, in the Vopus area, that's in Colombia mostly, 
we have uh, very coherent mythological stories, all practically divided in several chapters, following each other, and in a quite coherent order. And then we have the question, uh, what does it mean? Because it could mean two different things. It could mean, for instance, that the coherent order, like a kind of a saga, is the primitive condition, and that whenever we collect meat as a disconnected element, it is the result of a process of uh, deterioration, disorganization, and uh, we can only find uh, scattered elements of what was uh, primitively a meaningful whole. Or else we could uh, hypothesize that the disconnected state is the archaic one and that the myth were put together in order by uh, native wise men and philosophers who do not exist everywhere, but only in some societies of a given type. We have exactly the same problem, for instance, with the Bible, because uh, there it seems that the raw material was made up of disconnected element and that learned philosopher have put them together in order to make a continuous story. And uh, it would be extremely important to find out if among uh, people without writing, uh, who are studied by the anthropologist, it is the same or a completely different kind. Uh, now, the second problem is of a more, uh, also theoretical, but uh, of a more practical nature. In a former time, that is in, let's say, in the late 19th century, early 20th century, mythological material was collected mostly by anthropologists, that is, people from the outside. And, of course, they had, in many cases, and especially in Canada, they had uh, native collaborators. Let me, for instance, quote the case of Franz Boas, who had a quite cute assistant, George Hunt. As a matter of fact, he, he was not exactly quite cute because he was born uh, of a Scottish father and a Tlingit mother, but he was raised among the Quakult, married among the Quakult, and completely identified with the culture. And for the Tsimshian, Boas had Henry Tate, who was a literary Tsimshian, and Marius Barbeau had William Bennion, who was also a literary Tsimshian. So the native cooperation was secured from the beginning. But nevertheless, the fact is that Hunt, Tate, or Bennion worked under the guidance of the anthropologist. That is, they were turned into anthropologists themselves. Of course, they knew best uh, legends, tradition belonging to their own clan, their own lineage, but nevertheless, they were equally interested in collecting data from other families, other clans, and the like. And uh, when uh, we look at this enormous corpus of uh, Indian mythology, uh, such as, for instance, uh, Boas and Tate's uh, Tsimshian mythology, or uh, the Quakut text collected by uh, Hunt and edited and uh, published, translated to by Boas, uh, we uh, find more or less the same uh, organization of the data, because it is the one which uh, was recommended by the anthropologist. For instance, in the beginning, cosmological and cosmogonical uh, myth, and uh, later on, much later on, what can be considered as uh, legendary tradition and family histories. 
Now, it so happened that this task, which was started by the anthropologists, the Indians are taking it up themselves, and for uh, different purposes, for instance, uh, to have their language and mythology taught in uh, elementary schools for uh, Indian uh, children, that's uh, very important, I understand, right now. And uh, also another purpose is to use uh, legendary tradition to validate claims against the white people, territorial claims, political claims, and so on. So it is extremely important to find out if there is a difference, and in that case, what kind of difference, between traditions collected from the outside or from the inside, but as if they were collected from the outside. And we are fortunate, uh, you are fortunate enough in Canada, I should say, uh, that uh, books about uh, their own mythology and uh, legendary traditions were organized and published by uh, Indian specialists uh, themselves. Uh, this uh, began early, for instance, uh, there is a book by uh, Pauline Johnson that was before the First World War. And uh, later on, well, we had books by Barbeau, who was, of course, not Indian at all, but uh, who tried to uh, collect uh, historical or semi-historical material and make himself the spokesman of his uh, Indian informants. And he produced, so to speak, his own version of that mythology. And even more interesting, far more interesting, are uh, books such as uh, Men of Medic, which was published uh, in Kitimat in 1962, which uh, is supposedly the verbatim account collected from uh, the mouth of Chief Wright, a uh, Tsimshan chief of the Middle Skina River, but collected by somebody else a white uh, field worker, uh, it was not a, even a professional. And uh, even more important, the recent book by uh, Chief Kenneth Harris, who is also a Simpson chief, published in 1974 by himself. So we can, uh, with this kind of material, make a kind of experiment by comparing the material collected by anthropologists and the material collected and published directly by... Uh, uh, I should not say exactly collected, as a matter of fact, because uh, instead of being a tradition from uh, several families, several clans, several lineage put together and uh, juxtaposed to each other, it is really the history of uh, one family, one clan, which we have here yeah, collected and published by uh, one, uh, and more important, of uh, their descendant. Well, the problem is where does mythology end and where does history start? In the case, which is entirely new to us, of an history without archives, because there are no uh, written document, of course, it's only a verbal tradition, and it is claimed to be history at uh, the same time. Now, if we compare two of these histories, the one obtained on the middle Skina from Chief Wright, and the one published, written and published, by Chief uh, Harris from a family up uh, in the Hazelton area, we find similarities and we find differences. In uh, the account of Chief Wright, we have uh, what I would call the genesis of a disorder. That is, uh, the entire story aim at explaining why, after their first uh, beginning, 
et given clan or lineage or group of lineages have overcome a great many ordeals, unknown period of success and period of failures, and have been progressively led toward a disastrous ending. It is an extremely uh, pessimistic uh, story, really the history of a downfall. While in the case of Chief Harris, there is a quite different outlook, because uh, the book appears principally geared at uh, explaining the origin of a social order, which was the social order in the historical period, and which is still embedded, if I may say so, in the several uh, names, titles, privileges, uh, which a given individual occupying a proeminent place in his uh, family and uh, clan has uh, collected by inheritance around himself. So it is as if a diachronical succession of uh, events was uh, simultaneously projected on the screen of the present in order to reconstitute piece by piece a synchronic order which exists and which illustrated by the roster of name and privileges of a given individual. Both story, both books are positively fascinating and are literally speaking great pieces, but uh, for uh, the anthropologist, their main interest is to illustrate the characteristics of a kind of history widely different from our own, since history as we write it is practically entirely based upon written uh, documents, while in that case uh, there are obviously no uh, written uh, documents, or uh, very little. Now what strikes me when I uh, try to compare both accounts is that uh, both of them start uh, accordingly with the account of a mythical, or perhaps historical, of course, I don't know, uh, archaeology will perhaps uh, settle the matter, but nevertheless, the time when, uh, on the upper Skina, uh, near what is uh, now Hazelton, there was a big town, uh, which uh, Barbo called uh, Temlaham. And what happened there? which is practically everywhere the same story, which explained that the city was destroyed and that the remnant of the people uh, went on the move, uh, see, and started difficult peregrinations among the Skinner. Uh, now, this, uh, of course, can be an historical event. But uh, if we look closely at the way it is explained, we see that the type of event is uh, the same, but not exactly the details. For instance, uh, there can be, according to the version, at the origin, a fight between uh, two villages or two towns, and a fight which originated in uh, an adultery. But it can be either because a husband has uh, killed the lover of his wife, or because brothers have killed their sister's lover, or because 
a husband has killed his wife because she has a, a lover, they say. So, you see, uh, we have an explanatory cell. The structure, the basic structure of it, or the basic nature, I should rather say, is the same. But the structure of the cell is not the same and can vary. So uh, it is a kind of uh, mini myth, if I may say so, because it's very short, it's very condensed, but it has still the same property of the myth, that is that we can observe it under different transformations, and when an element is being transformed, then the other elements should be uh, rearranged accordingly. This is uh, the first aspect. The second aspect is that uh, it is an history which is uh, highly repetitive. That is, the same type of event can be used several times in order to account for uh, different uh, happenings. And for instance, it is striking that uh, in the story of the particular tradition of Chief Wright and the particular tradition of Chief Harris, we find similar happenings, but they don't take place at the same place, uh, in the same spot, they don't interest the same people, and uh, very likely uh, not exactly at the same uh, historical period. You see, what we, we discover by uh, reading these books is that the opposition, the simple opposition between mythology and history, which we are accustomed to make, is not at all a clear-cut one, and that there is an intermediary level. You see, mythology is static. That is, uh, we find the same uh, mythical elements which are combined over and over again, but it is entirely limited. It is a closed system, let us say, in contradistinction with history, which is, of course, an open system. The open character of history is secured by the innumerable ways according to which mythical cells, or cells, explanatory cells, which were originally mythical, can be arranged and uh, rearranged. So uh, it shows us that by using the same material, because it is a kind of uh, common inheritance, common patrimony of all groups, of all clans, of all lineages, you can nevertheless succeed building up an original account for each of them. What is misleading in the old anthropological account is that a kind of a hodgepodge was made up of uh, tradition and beliefs belonging to a great many different social groups. And uh, this uh, makes us uh, lose sight of a fundamental character of the material, that is, that each type of story belongs to a given group, to a given family, to a given lineage, to a given clan, and try to explain its fate, which can be a successful one or a, a disastrous one, which can be intended to account for rights and privileges in the present, as they exist in the present, or to validate claims for rights which have uh, since uh, disappeared. If when we try to do scientific history, we really do something scientific, or don't we too remain 
astride our own mythology and what uh, we are trying to make as a pure history. You see, it is, uh, it is very interesting to look at the way both in North and South America, that is, we have uh, observations from everywhere and also everywhere in the world, it is how an individual who has, by right and by inheritance, a certain account of uh, the mythology or the legendary uh, tradition of his own group, reacts when he listens to a different version given by uh, somebody belonging to a different family or to a different clan or lineage, which to some extent is similar, but to some extent too is extremely different. Now, we would think that uh, it is impossible that two accounts which are not the same can be true at the same time. And nevertheless, they seem to be accepted as true in some cases. The only difference made is that one account is better than the other, more accurate. In some other cases, the two accounts can be considered as equally valid because the difference between them are not perceived as such. Now, uh, we are not at all aware in daily life, let's say, that we are exactly in the same situation in relation to different historical accounts written by uh, different historians. We only pay attention to what is basically similar and we neglect the difference which are due to the fact that the way they carve the data and the way they interpret it is not uh, exactly uh, the same. So if uh, you take two accounts by uh, historian with different intellectual tradition and different political leanings given of uh, the American Revolution, of the French-English War uh, in Canada or the French Revolution. Uh, we are not so shocked or rarely shocked that, as a matter of fact, they don't tell us exactly the same thing. So uh, my uh, impression is that by uh, studying carefully this truly historical account in the general sense of the world, which Indian contemporary authors try to give us of their own past, and not considering them as a fanciful account, but trying extremely carefully and with the help of uh, a type of uh, salvage archaeology, that is, uh, trying to excavate a village site which are referred to in their mythology or legendary accounts, and trying to establish correspondences in as much as it is possible between different accounts, trying to find what really correspond and what does not uh, correspond, we may, in the end, reach a better understanding of what historical science really is. See, I am not uh, far from believing that in our own societies history has replaced mythology and fulfills the same function. That is, not only to explain the past, but to provide a charter for the present and to orient the future. The difference perhaps being that for uh, societies without writing, without archives, 
the aim of uh, mythology is to ensure that as closely as possible, which is obviously impossible, but as closely as possible, the future will remain faithful to the present and to the past, while for us, the future should be always different and more different from the present, uh, but in a different direction, of course, uh, according to our uh, political uh, preferences. But nevertheless, the gap which in our mind exists to some extent between uh, mythology and uh, history, this gap can probably be overcome by uh, studying with their help histories which are not at all separated but conceived as a continuation of the mythology. Claude Lévi-Strauss, professor of social anthropology at the Collège de France, with the fourth of the 1977 Massey Lectures. His final talk tomorrow is on myth and music. This year's Massey Lectures are being published by the University of Toronto Press. They'll be issued in paperback in the early spring of 1978 and will be sold at your local bookstore. Or you can obtain a copy by sending $5 to the University of Toronto Press Front Campus, Toronto, Ontario, M5S1A6. That address again, the University of Toronto Press, Front Campus, Toronto, Ontario, M5S1A6. Welcome to Ideas. Good evening, I'm Russ Germain. Tonight we present the last of the 1977 Massey Lectures by Claude Lévi-Strauss. That's in the first half of tonight's program. And in the second half, The Trouble with White Folks, a native perspective on red man, white world. But first, to Claude Lévi-Strauss. In his talk yesterday, he discussed myth and history and said that we must come to see history as a continuation of mythology. In his own work, Lévi-Strauss has sought to understand how mythology can teach us about fundamental structures of the human mind, and throughout his lectures this week, he's emphasized the relevance of mythology in the modern context. Now, in his fifth and final talk, he discusses myth and music. Claude Lévi-Strauss. This relationship between myth and uh, music, on which I have uh, insisted so much in the initial section of The Raw and the Cooked, and also in the final section of L'Homme Nu, uh, there is not yet a, an English title because it's not translated, so I have to quote the title in French. Well, probably it was uh, the part which gave uh, rise to more misunderstandings, especially in the English-speaking world, but also in France because it was thought that uh, this relationship was uh, quite arbitrary. And uh, on the contrary, my feeling was uh, that there was not one but two different kind of relationship, one of similarity and the other one of contiguity, and that, as a matter of fact, uh, they were actually the same. But uh, that I did not understand right away. And it is the relation of similarity which uh, struck me first, which I shall try to explain in the following way. Now, if we take the similarity aspect first, my main point was that uh, exactly as in a musical score, it is impossible to understand a myth as a continuous sequence. This is why we should be aware that uh, if you try to read a myth as we read, uh, let's say, a novel or a newspaper article, that is uh, line after line and uh, starting from uh, left to right, 
we don't understand the niche because we have to apprehend it as a totality and uh, discover that the basic meaning of the myth is not conveyed by the sequence of events, but by, uh, if I may say so, bundles of events, although these events appear at different moments in the story. Uh, therefore, we have to read the myth more or less like we would do with an orchestra score, not uh, stave after stave, but understanding that we should apprehend the whole page and understand that something which is written on the first stave at the top of the page acquires only meaning if one considers that it is part and parcel of what is written beneath on the second stave and beneath on the third stave and so on. That is not only from left to right, but at the same time vertically from top to bottom. Uh, we have to understand that uh, it is a totality, and it is only by treating the myth as if it were an orchestra score, written stave after stave, that uh, you can understand it as a totality, that you can extract meaning out of the myth. Now, why and how does it happen? My feeling is that it is the second aspect, the aspect of contiguity, which give us the significant clue. As a matter of fact, it is about the same time that the mythical thought, I would not say vanish or disappear, but passed to the background in Western thought, a phenomenon which took place more or less about the Renaissance and the 17th century, a time when uh, the first novels began to appear instead of stories uh, still built on the model of mythology. And it is exactly at that time that uh, we witnessed the apparition of uh, the great musical style characteristic of the late 17 and uh, mostly 18 and 19th century. It is exactly as if uh, music has uh, completely changed its traditional shape in order to take over the function, the intellectual as well as emotive function, which mythical thought was giving up more or less at the same period. And of course, when I speak of uh, music, I should uh, qualify the term. Music, as taking over the traditional function of mythology, is not any kind of music, but music uh, as it appeared in the Western civilization in the 17th century, and early 18th century with Frescobaldi I and Bach, and which reached its full development with Mozart, Beethoven, and Wagner in the 18th and 19th century. Now, what I would like to do in order to clarify uh, this statement is uh, to offer a concrete uh, example which I shall take in uh, Wagner's uh, Tetralogy. One of the most important musical theme in the Tetralogy is uh, the one which uh, we call in French le thème de la renonciation à l'amour, renunciation of love, which, as is well known, appears first of all in Rheingold, at the very moment when Alberic 
is told by the Rhine maiden that uh, he can only conquer the gold if he renounce all kind of uh, human love. And at that time there is a very starting uh, musical motif which is uh, sung by uh, Alberic and uh, at the very moment when he says that uh, he takes uh, the gold but he renounces love once and for all. And this is very clear and simple. It is, let us say, the literal sense of the theme. Actually, he is renouncing love. Now, the second striking important moment when the theme reappears is uh, in the Valkyria in a circumstance where it is extremely difficult to understand why. That is, at the moment when Sigmund has just uh, discovered that Singlind is his sister, has fallen in love at first time with her, and when they are going to initiate an incestuous uh, relationship, thanks to the sword which is buried in the tree and which uh, Sigmund is going to tear away from the tree. And at that moment, the theme of renunciation of love reappears, which uh, is some kind of a mystery, because at that moment, Sigmund is not at all renouncing love, is going quite the opposite, to know love for the first time of his life with his sister Sigrid. And uh, the third apparition of the theme is also in the Valkyria, at the last act, at the moment when Wotan, the king of the gods, is uh, condemning uh, his daughter Brunhilde to a very long uh, magical sleep and uh, surround her with fire. And we can, as a matter of fact, think that Wotan is also renouncing love because he is renouncing his love for his daughter, but uh, nevertheless, this is not uh, very convincing. Then, you see, we have exactly the same problem as in uh, mythology. That is, we have a theme, here a musical theme instead of being a mythological uh, theme, which is appearing at three different moments in a very long story. One at the early beginning, one in the middle, and one, if for the sake of the argument we limit ourselves to consider the uh, two first operas and we leave the two other aside, uh, the third at, uh, at the end. And uh, what I would like to show is that the only way of understanding this mysterious reappearance of the theme is to put the three events, although they seem very different together, to pile them up one over uh, the other and uh, to try to discover if they cannot be treated as one and the same event. Now, if we start that, we can uh, remark that in the three different occasions there is a treasure which has to be pulled away or torn away from what is uh, binded to. There is the gold which is stuck in the depth of the Rhine. There is the sword which is stuck in a tree, which is a symbol of the tree of life, the tree of the universe. And there is uh, the woman Brunhilde, which will have to be pulled out of the fire. And then the recurrence of the theme suggests to us that, as a matter of fact, the gold, the sword, and Brunhilde are 
one and the same. The gold as a mean to conquer power, the sword as a mean to conquer victory, and the woman as a mean to conquer love, if I may say so. And the fact that uh, we have a kind of coalescence between the gold, the sword, and the woman, as a matter of fact, is the best explanation we have of the reason why, at the end of the twilight of, of the god, it is through Brunhild that the gold will return to the Rhine. Because as a matter of fact, they have been one and the same, but look uh, uh, through uh, different angles. Uh, we have also other points which are made very clear. For instance, if uh, Alberic renounces love, he will uh, later on, thanks to the gold, become able to seduce a woman which will bear a son, Hagen. And it is also thanks to the conquest of the sword that uh, Sigmund will beget a son, which will be Siegfried. And so the recurrence of the theme shows us something which is never explained anywhere, but that there is a kind of uh, twin relationship between Hagen the traitor and Siegfried the hero. They are in a very close parallelism. And this explains also why it will be possible that Siegfried and Hagen, or rather Siegfried under the disguise of Hagen, will, at different moments of the story, conquer Brunhild. Uh, I could uh, go on very long like that, but perhaps uh, this is sufficient to explain the similarity of method between uh, the analysis of myth and the understanding of music. When we listen to music, after all, we are listening to something which uh, goes on from beginning to end and which develop through time listen to a symphony, a symphony has a beginning, has a middle, it has an end. But nevertheless, I would not understand anything of the symphony, and I would not get any pleasure, musical pleasure, out of it, if I were not able, at each moment, to muster what I have listened before, what I am listening now, and uh, to remain conscious of the totality of the music. That is the fact when a theme reappears as uh, the initial theme or as a variation on the theme. I have, if you take the musical uh, formula of theme and uh, variations, for instance, you can uh, only perceive it and feel it if that for each variation you keep in mind the theme which you have uh, listened to uh, first, and each variation has a flavor of its own, if unconsciously you can superpose it to the earlier variation that you have previously listened. So there is a kind of uh, continuous reconstruction which is taking place in the mind of uh, the listener of music or the listener to a mythical story. It's not only a global similarity, it is exactly as if when uh, inventing the specific musical forms, music had only rediscovered structures which already existed on the mythical level. And uh, for instance, it's very striking that the fugue, exactly as it has been formalized in Bach's time, is the true-to-life representation of the working of some specific myth. That is a, a kind of myth when we have two characters or two groups of characters. 
let's say, one good, uh, the other one uh, bad, uh, for instance, but it, it is an oversimplification. And when the story unrolled by the myth is that one group is trying to flee and to escape the other group of uh, character, so you have a chase of one group at the other, sometimes uh, group A rejoining group B, sometimes group B escaping exactly as in a fugue. You have uh, what we call in French le sujet, la réponse. And uh, going on like that through the story, and then a climax happens when both groups are uh, almost confused, confounded. And finally, the solution of this conflict, which has been going on, is uh, offered by a conjugation of the two principles which were opposed during all uh, the myth, that is a conflict between power above and powers below uh, the sky and the earth, or uh, the sun, or uh, subterranean powers and the like, which, and the solution is offered by a kind of conjugation which is very much alike in structure as the chords which end the musical piece and which uh, offers also a conjugation of uh, extremes which uh, for once and at last are being reunited. And it could be shown also that there are uh, really uh, myths or uh, groups of myths which are constructed like a sonata or like a symphony or like a rondo or a toccata or all the musical forms which music did not really invent, but unconsciously borrowed from the structure of the myth. Now, the comparison between music and language is an extremely uh, tricky one, because to some extent the comparison is extremely close, and there are at the same time tremendous uh, differences. Say, uh, linguists, uh, contemporary linguists have told us that the basic element uh, of language are phonemes. Uh, phonemes, that is, uh, those sounds which we represent incorrectly uh, by the use of uh, letters, which have no meaning in themselves, but which are combined in order to differentiate meaning. Now, uh, you could say practically the same thing of the musical notes, because a note, A, B, C, D, has no meaning in itself. It is just a note, and it is only the combination of the notes which can create music. So you could very well uh, say that while in uh, language we have uh, phonemes as uh, elementary material, in music, we would have something which in French I would call the sonem. Uh, in English, I, I don't know, perhaps tonemes would do. This is a similarity. But if you think of the next step, the next stage, the next level, rather, in language, you uh, find that phonemes are combined together in order to make words. And words are, in their turn, combined together to make sentences. Now, in music, there are no words. The elementary material, that is the notes, are combined together, but what you have right away is a sentence, that is a melodic phrase. So, you see, while in language you have free very definite step, that is phonemes, combined to make words, words which are combined to make sentence. In music you have, with the notes, something of the same kind as phonemes, from a logical point of view, but you miss the word level, and you go directly to a sentence. Now, if you take mythology, 
you can compare mythology both to music and to language, but with a difference. That is, in mythology, you have no phonemes. That is, the lower element you can use are words. So, if we take language as a paradigm, see, the paradigm is constituted by, first, phonemes, second, words, third, sentence. In music, you have the equivalent to phonemes and the equivalent to sentence, but you don't have an equivalent to words. In myth, you have an equivalent to word, an equivalent to sentence, but you have no equivalent to phonemes. So there is, in both cases, one level missing. And uh, if we try to understand the relationship between language, myth, and music, we can only do it by using language as the point of departure. And then it can be shown that music on the one hand and mythology on the other both stem from languages but go apart in different directions. That uh, music emphasizes the sound aspect which was already embedded in language while mythology emphasizes the sense aspect, the meaning aspect, which was also embedded in language. Claude Lévi-Strauss, professor of social anthropology at the Collège de France, with the last of the 1977 Massey Lectures. The lectures this year are being published by the University of Toronto Press. They'll be issued in paperback in the early spring and will be sold at your local bookstore or you can order a copy by sending $5 to the University of Toronto Press, Front Campus, Toronto, Ontario, M5S1A6.